10 years ago, I became a mom. If this is your spot. <laughs> On October 29th, 2009, um, my six-year-old son and I, it was two days before Halloween, were getting ready for breakfast. We're, you know, talking, getting ready for school. And he looks up at me and says, hey, mom. And he throws up all over the floor. I said, hey, buddy, you OK? He said, I think I'm OK. And I thought, you know what, let's run by the pediatrician's office before the holidays and everything. She says it's a virus. Kids are back in school. Stomach bugs going around. And I said, you know, he said he had a headache. And she said, well, kids can get headaches from throwing up. And she saw the look on my face. And she said, Amber, you want a MRI or a CAT scan or something? And I didn't even leave her office without making the appointment. So I'm on the phone with them, and they are giving me dates uh, you know, well into the holidays. And I'm thinking, let's just get this over with. Do you have anything sooner than this? They put me on hold and come back and said, we have 8.30 tonight. I said, you do MRIs on children at 8.30 at night? And she said, tonight we do. So we went. 8.30, we had the MRI. And they said, wait around, and we'll give you some information. OK. So 11.30 rolls around, and they come in. And three clergymen walk in and ask me to step out in the hallway. So I do. I see my husband standing to the side with big, red, puffy eyes. And he mouths to me, it's bad. I see on the other side a doctor. And in the center is a computer monitor with the silhouette of my son's head and a golf ball-sized tumor in the center of it. The doctor looks at me and says, Mrs. Larkin, your son has brain cancer. In a matter of 12 hours, we went from stomach bug to brain cancer. And we didn't leave the hospital. 7 AM, brain surgery is scheduled. The doctor said, don't expect him to walk, talk, see, speak, anything. If he survives, and if he survives a year, he may learn some of those things back. All the what ifs started flooding in my head. What if I never see my son again? What if I never hear his voice? What if he doesn't know who I am? Wait a minute, what if I never see my son again? And I kissed him, and they wheeled him off into surgery. After nine hours of my husband and I being on our knees, the surgeon comes out, and he says, good news. We were able to resect the entire tumor. We got the whole thing. The only thing that's left is a coating where it was laying in possible residual cells. And even better than that, when we moved him from the operating table back to the bed, he said, please don't move me. I'm comfortable. And I thought, OK, my Jedi Noah is in there. Force is strong with him. That night in the pediatric intensive care unit, Noah lay covered in IVs. And I sat and held his hand. And in my most strong motherly voice, explained to him. I said, Noe, mom and dad are going to get you through this. You will not remember this. We will never forget this. And this will not define you. And I just sat in the dark and thought, what if there was something that could go in there and eat whatever was left, whatever he said, residual cells, whatever it was, just go in there and eat it, and we could go home. Also that night, the doctors came in with three three-ring binders and said, Mr. and Mrs. Larkin, we're going to need you to read through these protocols, these trials, and pick which one you want your son to be on. I was like, oh, OK, we can do that, but what's a protocol? <laughs> so a protocol is a road map of drugs given over time to help fight, try to fight the cancer. And we thought, you pick. Pick which one's going to save his life. And once again, with big, red, sad eyes, they said, well, we don't know. And I thought, 
wow, that's why they're called trials. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, you know, I was not in a third world country. I was not standing in a tent with dirt under my feet. These kids were more than trials. They're more than just research. And we need something better, something different. That's when my search for something different began. As a parent, you prepare your child for all of life's what ifs. There is absolutely no way to prepare your child for pediatric cancer. But we did what we had to do, and we began down the road of protocols. Noah started radiation and chemotherapy. I became a momcologist and a researcher. We literally traveled the world searching for that something better, that something different. I interviewed doctors, read hundreds of white papers, medical journals, published research papers. I even got numerous doctors from around the world on conference calls and then hit conference. Surprise, <laughs> I wanted them to talk. And I was on the trail of personalized cell therapies. The personal approach to fighting cancer made so much sense to me. Each person's cancer is so different for their body. Why were we still trying to shoot a grain of salt with a shotgun? Because that's what chemotherapy was to me. Along this journey, I learned a lot. In the last 30 years, there have been absolutely zero new drugs created for Noah's type of cancer. In fact, in the past 20 years, there has been one new drug created expressly for any type of pediatric cancer. Philanthropy is the key to new research, and I was actually told to my face in one of these interviews that creating new drugs for these orphan diseases, because that's what pediatric cancer is considered, an orphan disease, didn't have enough ROI, return on investment. 80% of pediatric oncology is done outside of first world economies. And here in America, historically, the big cancer societies, for every dollar that you donate, between one penny and three pennies is given towards pediatric cancer research. That's it. Survival curves have flattened, and in sp especially in Noah's case, statistics are just really good advertising. They're one-year statistics. There are no three-year, there are no five-year statistics. And I found out that in that one-year statistic, they do not take into consideration the quality of life of the child at all. If he's breathing, that's a check in the alive box. And that terrified me. Over the next two years, with the absolute love and care of all of our doctors, we did very carefully the protocols that were available to us, on study as well as off study. Some of these protocols were so torturous on the child, it can leave a child with an abused child syndrome. Some of the drugs were crazy like thalidomide mixed with a cholesterol medicine, mixed with three other chemotherapies. Another one was high, high doses of Accutane, which is an acne medicine. And we used to have to sign affidavits to prove that he was not pregnant. Our eight-year-old son, not pregnant. I used to think, if I went into the kitchen sink and just got everything out, put it in a big bowl, I bet this would kill cancer too. But what else is it doing to his little body? Not one child that goes through the protocols that Noah was going through doesn't come out with long-term side effects if they survive. And like I said before, I just wanted something to go in there and just eat it, just eat it, without the toxicities, without the nonsense. So I kept my research going. It's now March of 2011, and it's clinic day. So I'm gathering all my notebooks and all my T-cell therapy and immune-based therapy and viral therapies and taking them to clinic with us to ask the doctors my millions of questions, usually to no avail, but this day was different. This day, the doctor sat with me and I'm going through my papers and he's very intent on looking, you know, what I'm reading and he's staring at me and he said, Amber, I know who you're looking for. I said, 
give me their name, give me their name, you know how long I've been doing this. And he said, well, confidentiality, uh, I can't do that. But I am going to do something for you. I'm going to call them and track them down, and I'm going to give them your information. I said, great, great. That night at 11.30 at night, my cell phone starts ringing. I answer it, and I hear, is this Amber? This is Dr. Lawrence Cooper from MD Anderson, Houston. How did you find me? It was the primary investigator on the cell therapy that I was looking for. I start talking a million miles an hour. I'm talking about T-cell therapy, and I found your papers on this, and he's like, oh, forget that. That's a thing of the past. You went in K-cell therapy. Okay, then I went in K-cell therapy. He was very cautiously talking to me as I was basically begging him to change his entire course of research to pediatric brain cancer. We did this for five nights straight. Each time, he would ask me a lot of questions, getting information. Well, Noah would have to have a port. Check, he's got that. He would have to have a shunt. Check, he's got that. He would have to have an Omaya port in his brain. Check, 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 check. He had everything. I, in turn, asked my questions. I said, you know, why isn't personalized cell therapy up front in the first line of defense for cancer treatment? And he said, it's brand new. And people are scared to go first. I knew my husband and I were not scared to go first. We had one patient, and he was our son. So after five nights straight, the next night, Dr. Cooper calls me, and he says yes. He said yes, that he and his lab would change their course of research and apply personalized immune-based NK cell therapy to pediatric brain cancer. This is a first in the world. Okay, here's my science lesson for the night. NK cells, what I've been mentioning, are natural killer cells. They're found in our uh, immune system. They are the most aggressive of our white blood cells. We all have them. They're floating around your blood right now. They actually reach out and they touch cells. And they say, good cell, good cell, good cell. Uh-oh, here's a virus or a bacteria. And they have little tentacles. They actually reach out and poison it. And that's how, basically, our immune system works. In the most layman of terms, what Dr. Cooper and his lab have been able to do are take these NK cells, strip them from their normal hunting ability of bacteria or virus, feed them the individual's cancer, reprogram them to hunt only that, put them back in your body, and that's the only thing they hunt for. Do you want to see it? <laughs> Okay, you'll see the NK cells are the little white cells on the left. They have been reprogrammed to hunt and destroy the big green cells. They've been dyed green so we can see them. These are living medulloblastoma. That's the type of cancer Noah had. So um, they're also called DAOI cells. Watch what happens. As you can see, the NK cells are hunting the cancer cells, and they're killing them. One more. What you are looking at are dead cancer cells by our immune system. No radiation, no chemotherapy, no toxicities. Dead cancer cells by our immune system. So the plan was Noah was going to be the first, and then we were going to open this up as a new phase one trial for all children. We had conference calls every two weeks, and the consortium grew. The doctors and researchers from all over the world, London, Brazil, India, all bringing their piece of what was now known as the NOAA protocol. <laughs> Time was ticking, and the protocol was written and rewritten and massaged and sent to the IRB, which is the Internal Review Board at MD Anderson. They were so floored at the paradigm shift that this pre presented in curing cancer that they said this immune-based therapy holds the closest promise to a cure that we have seen in three decades. But there was a but. The but was it couldn't be a study of one. It had to be open as a full phase one trial. 
back to the drawing board. They were rewriting and rewriting fast and furious. And I knew time wasn't on our side because we had already been battling Noah's cancer for over two and a half years. And every second mattered. On May 29, 2012, my Noah was not the first one to receive the Noah protocol. Instead, he received his wings and he was freed from cancer forever. Just not in the way we'd hoped. End of my story. Is my what if turned into what was or what might have been? No. My what if has now turned into what is and what's to come. My Noah's posthumous gift to cell therapy has pushed it faster than we could have ever imagined, actually getting it benched to bedside from research to children. His still living cells are being used right now by our researchers today. They have grown his medulloblastoma in animal models, treated it with NK cell therapy, and not only did it inhibit the growth of the medulloblastoma cancer, those animals are cancer free. This is a first in history, a first in children, a first in brain cancer, the first time NK cells have ever been activated in the fourth ventricle, and a new catalyst for all pediatric cancer researchers. They have even taken my blood and my husband's blood and taken RNK cells to see if RNK cells can fight the child's cancer for less trauma on the child. I am so proud to say that the NOAA protocol is poised to be opened as a full phase one trial by the end of this year and has now been deemed new opportunity advancing hope for families who have been told they will no longer have their child. My new what if. My new what if is what if a child is diagnosed with pediatric brain cancer, goes through the NOAA protocol, and gets to go home, back to life, back to their family. What if these personalized cell therapies, because they can be used technically for any type of cancer, what if they cure all cancer? Who knows? Little did I know the night that I was holding Noah's hand in that intensive care unit, telling him how this was not going to define him. He was defining me. All this started because of one amazing young little boy, my Noah, and a what if, and it's just the beginning. Thank you.